Good morning, everybody. We're going to call the uh, July 10th Design Council meeting to order here this morning at 10.02. Item on our agenda today is the approval of the minutes from the May 1st uh, meeting. And so let's do these one at a time. We have two of them. We're also going to have two fifth. So let's um, look for an approval of the minutes from our May 1st meeting. I move to approve. Second. All right. Uh, motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Second minutes, the June 5th meeting. Move to approve. Consistent, Matt. Thank you. All right. Motion by Jeff, second by Matt. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? This is unanimously. Second item on our agenda today downtown Wichita utility box. Emily. Welcome, Emily. Can I just Can go. Good morning. I'm Emily Brookover. I am director of creative engagement and placemaking for downtown Wichita. And I'm really excited to talk to you all this morning about something that you've probably seen a lot in other cities as you visited is utility box art. So just a couple examples uh, to give you some visual representation of what I'm talking about. So you can see the cities underneath where these boxes come from and they can be fun and silly. They can be colorful and abstract, and they can certainly be representative of community history and culture. So what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is a pilot program. So we would begin with six utility boxes along Waterman. This is a, a street that I drive every day to and from work, so I'm staring at these utility boxes at least twice a day. Um, we would utilize our existing Alley Doors artwork catalog uh, to pull artwork from for these boxes. Downtown Wichita would cover the costs of installation and future maintenance. So $300 to the artist for the use of their artwork. And then depending on uh, the location, the size, and a couple of other variables, it would be $300 to $800 for box preparation, final printing, and installation. So with this pilot program, we would then gauge public response via conversation with area businesses, social media engagement, artist interest, et cetera. So we'd like to install these initial boxes and then listen for about a year to see how the public uh, and the, the surrounding businesses respond to this art. So the benefits of using vinyl is it does not restrict participation to just painters and muralists. Uh, it'll be open to all disciplines, including graphic design, photography, sculpture, et cetera. So the Alley Doors project, we were able to open it up to multi-discipline uh, artists as well. And we even had a glass blower who created these beautiful glass sculptures and then was able to take photographs of those glass sculptures and submit those. Uh, and in any other context, you know, he wouldn't have been able to participate in a project like that. So it can also be easily replaced if damaged or vandalized, and there's no loss of original artwork. The artist also will retain the original work for sale or future licensing. So they're just letting us borrow at the artwork for the utility box. So here are the utility boxes I stare at every day. So the first is on the south side of Waterman between Commerce and St. Francis, the southeast corner of Waterman and Emporia, the southeast corner of Waterman and Topeka, and the last three, the southwest corner of Waterman and Broadway, southwest corner of Waterman and Market, and the northwest corner of Waterman and Maine. So as you can see just by our little map, it's a really great straight shot. We would have six um, really great located utility boxes along Waterman. So here's the Alley Doors project that I referenced before. Um, these are four of, I want to say we've got 12. We're getting a, another one right now for Lucinda's. So this was a program that we launched several years ago that was unfortunately paused because of COVID, but um, it's 
we're working on it again, so we've relaunched it. But this was a way to put our work on back of building doors that, um, you know, were tagged a lot, that were sad and boring, and it was a way to increase walkability and safety in these areas. So hopefully you've seen some of these as you've uh, wandered around downtown. So we have over 100 images from 38 Kansas-based artists in this catalog. We held an open call for entry and had a really great response. So we are already sitting on a really great um, collection of artwork that we can pull from for this initial pilot project. So following a successful pilot program, because it'll be great and everyone will love it, downtown Wichita will add additional boxes annually, depending on our budget. Uh, to the downtown district via a call for entry to Kansas artists. So we will open this up um, for a new call for entry once this pilot project is successful. The lifespan of vinyl is three to five years, depending on, of course, location, weather, and general wear and tear, how often the city needs to get in and out of these boxes. Downtown Wichita will plan to assess the boxes annually, uh, take a count, a head count of the boxes, see how they're doing, and replace the vinyl as needed. And that's an opportunity to replace with the artwork that was previously there, or we could change it up every couple of years uh, and rotate new artists. Future box locations to include areas of downtown that are often overlooked. This is a really great and simple way to introduce public art into areas that are often overlooked. So first, second, and third streets on or near central and near government buildings, social service locations, et cetera. So just as an FYI, uh, because I work for downtown Wichita, I am limited by my uh, my district boundaries. So this pilot project and any future utility boxes will need to stay within my district. Uh, the north boundary is central to Kellogg, and then it goes from the Arkansas River to Washington. So because I am supported by uh, property tax dollars, within that district, um, those tax dollars that need to be reinvested within those boundaries. There is opportunity for expansion outside, outside these districts. Uh, we, of course, love to collaborate and join forces with other parts of town. And then if we were to get grant funding, that's another way I can work outside of these district boundaries. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but program benefits, strengthen public art visibility in high traffic areas, improve beautification, walkability, and safety in the downtown district, enhance community identity and strengthen local pride and attachment to place, greatly reduces and deters vandalism and graffiti. We've seen that firsthand with the Alley Doors project. We have yet to replace um, or fix an Alley Door, and that project was launched in 2019. Provide opportunity to reflect local history and culture. Support artists and the various arts communities within the city and state. This is a great opportunity not only for emerging artists, but for established artists as well. And there's a potential for professional assistance and education for artists who are unfamiliar with public art processes. This is a really simple way to get introduced to how public art works and to uh, respond to call for entries and, and work alongside folks like me and, and uh, with the city to get Part within the community. So I'm here to ask you for your blessing for this initial pilot project of the first six utility boxes along Waterman, and I am more than happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Zion Council, do we have any questions? I'm sure you've already talked to Engineering Public Works. Oh, yes have their blessing, endorsement, and all around. I do. Enthusiasm. Yes, enthusiastically. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was some concerns about the electronics within these boxes, and they were worried about overheating uh, and things like that, but in, in other cities all over the world, that has yet to be a problem. Uh, and my vinyl expert at the, the printing company that we use and collaborate with said it will actually help insulate and keep things cooler. So we've tried to negate any possible issues. Only set, my second question is when you select artists, would you be, I don't know if you're really necessarily bound, but would you bring those, the final artwork for those boxes back to us? Um, I, for the pilot project or if we were to, I certainly can. And that's more of a question. I don't even know if you're bound to. 
by any means, but I guess maybe it's up to the design council if you'd like to see it. Sure. Yeah. Prior to installation. Oh, soon. Yeah, I'd be happy to. No, if that's even appropriate. I mean, we're not, it's not city funds. I don't know, but it is on city. As a city property, and any semi-permanent or permanent modification for aesthetics would have to come through the site council. So, the project's coming here. Yeah. Concerned about the pilot program, but thereafter, semi-permanent or permanent fixtures would have to maybe wait until after the pilot. I think so. That yeah, I'm I'm open to whatever, and I I can certainly let you know even by email, just as an FYI, once that artwork selected. So I'm sure it'll be great. Let me know. Yeah, it's good. I can't wait. What's your schedule? ASAP. So as soon as I get your nod, we will we will get to work. So um, my first point of business will be to contact our printer so that they can go out and look at the boxes and determine if there's any which there won't be, but any preparation work that needs to be done. And then um, we'll get a, a small group internally together to choose artwork um, and we'll be off and running. So pretty quick, hopefully by fall. Any other questions? We got a motion we want to throw on table? Move to approve the proposal as presented. Second. And to approve a second, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'll keep you guys posted. Appreciate your time. Next on the agenda today, the Brewer Community Center. Oh, boy, strolls up there. This isn't for Troy, this is for everybody, but looking at the size of our agenda today, appreciate um, presenter, if you would, just be nice. To... We had a lengthy agenda today. Hopefully we'll be done by noon with a little help. You're up, Troy. So we did a lot of work on the PowerPoint, so I'll go through it. <laughs> so this is a, a really great project that we've been working on. Uh, it's the expansion of this recreation center and it's a rural recreation center that's in McAdams Park. So these are some of the major figures of history that have impacted this community, uh, African American community. And so part of this is and, and we'll talk a little bit about the art as well, but this is some of the focal point of the building. Um, but in general, the building is going to be really fantastic. We're really excited to, to actually expand the facility three times. Uh, we're going to be adding close to 30,000 square feet of the 10,000 square foot recreation center. So here is the footprint within the park. Um, and this is going to be some additional parking. Currently right now here are the basketball courts and the newest of the ball fields. This is the current building right now. And this is going to be the additional portion of the building that's going to be added on. Uh, primarily most of that square footage is the gym. <clears throat> Here's what some of the uh, exterior uh, viewpoints will look like. And due to cost, um, we are using some materials that we weren't expecting to use, but it is going to be a, a metal uh, frame um, and it will be metal on the outside as well. With the exception of this large area, which is really the translucent. Um, it's not necessarily glass, it's actually um, fiberglass that's that's made out of this, but it's actually translucent, which will add a lot of light into the gym, but also will give it a really distinguished look from the outside. And we're kind of excited what, what the look is going to compare with the old building. It'll be really kind of nice. So this is the entryway that's coming in uh, into the front doors. And these will become the front doors for both buildings, which will be become one building altogether, just attached in the middle. Over here on the left hand side where the old entrance uh, is currently right now, and this will be the new entrance. Again, here's uh, the, the exterior uh, materials. So there'll be a brick base, corrugated metal panels, aluminum force print storefront, um, Standing seam metal roof. And this is what I was talking about, these polycarbonate window system. 
so that it actually glows and in, in the nighttime the interior lights are going to be the lights going to come out and really kind of give it a great glow uh, exterior brick um, some of the existing metal windows and existing concrete on the old building some of those are going to be updated and, and renewed uh, the other part of it too is it was also trying to match some of the character of the old building as well so there was a lot of thought given into the, the these buildings how are they going to complement each other how they're going to work together it's always really hard to build a building it's even more hard or more harder to actually uh, put two buildings together and actually make a match. So um, here's some of the square footage of the existing building. Uh, right now, the existing building is almost 11,000 square feet, and there's going to be some interior modification to match some of the program that's going to be going on in that building to complement the new building as well. Uh, here is the new building, and we're going to add this two-court gymnasium, multi-purpose room, a dining room, meeting room, uh, with all the other support areas of restrooms, storage, mechanical. Uh, so some new offices as well. It's just going to be a great place to host a lot of activities. We're looking at <clears throat> really adding tons of programming here in the design of this building was really kind of made after the program that we're going to be doing in this building. Some of the interior uh, materials, so we're going to have some sealed concrete, carpet, wall tiles. Uh, the gym is going to be a hardwood gym, um, some resilient flooring in each one of the meeting rooms, um, solid face, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what EIM is, but uh, it's part of this color palette. Acoustic ceiling tiles and suspended wood plank ceilings. So again, a lot of thought was given into the interior design. I just want, didn't want it to be a simple looking recreation center, but wanted to add a lot of detail and splash to it. Um, as you can see from this rendering going into the building, here's your front desk. Um, we'll be using uh, a display board to add in all kinds of programming hours and all kinds of information instead of just flat flyers that we use right now. Uh, the ceiling is really going to be interesting as well, um, and there's going to be some opportunities for placing art within throughout the building. Here's another look at that front desk as you walk in. If you go through these doors, you'll be going into the back of the recreation center, which will also be used for programming. We've been working a lot on the colors and the materials, and, and I think this is great with some of the lighting that they've come up with. Uh, it really kind of adds a, a modern touch, but actually kind of blends in with the old building as well. This is an interesting uh, portion of the building. People will actually be able to watch the things that are going on inside from a lobby area just outside of the gym. Uh, this is what the gym is going to look like, and here's these windows, these translucent windows that we're talking about brings in a lot of natural light without a lot of heavy sunlight hitting inside. And as I, as I mentioned, it's going to really kind of illuminate the building at nighttime. Uh, we have some drop curtains. We'll be able to play volleyball, pickleball, tennis, basketball, and there is a walking track or walking space around the gym. Um, Bleachers will be able to come in and come out. There's uh, telescoping bleachers, also portable bleachers as well. This is what the dining room is going to look like uh, with tables and chairs. And this is going to be a really big flex room. It's got a uh, curtain that goes through the middle that can actually divide the room, and we'll be able to do a lot of different programming here. Uh, kitchen, one of the things that's really been of interest at late is um, providing space for people to. Uh, pilot or start different uh, businesses in regards to uh, cooking and, and kitchens. And so this will be an industrial kitchen where we'll be doing classes, but also a opportunity for different businesses to work out of until they move into a permanent place. 
another multi-purpose room, but this one's going to be featuring fitness. And so we have a stage here um, with this window that's going to go out into the back that kind of adds in some natural light. Some of the challenges that we've been dealing with in considerations of FEMA, we have an issue with the floodplain that we're trying to get some information on to finally uh, get this building out of the floodplain, which we're very confident that's going to happen. Uh, the existing building was actually built in 1950, uh, so there was a lot of constraints in regards to mechanical aspects and actually matching the building, but I think the architects did a great job. Uh, SFS is the architects, and they've been great to work with. Uh, coordinating with other park entities, such as League 42 and other activities in the park. The construction type was definitely one of the challenges and considerations. Um, so, and the integration of art. Uh, here's a little bit of a schedule that we're looking at. Uh, we are right around here, middle of July. Done a lot of design work. Uh, we actually design consultant. I'm sorry, the art consultant. And we'll be hiring artists with the next month or so to make sure that they have opportunities to integrate their art within the rest of the design. Here's a little bit of the budget. Um, some money is going to the existing building. Uh, 1.25, 7.25 7 million is going to be going to new construction. But we do have some money currently in our system right now to uh, help bolster the buildings. Primarily, that's going to go into the existing building. Uh, we've got some additional funding that was coming towards us and uh, $200,000 for the art integration. So the total project is going to be close to $14 million. That's a little bit more of a breakdown of all the dollars. And you can see what the majority of the dollars is going to be going into uh, the gym and multi-purpose rooms um, that we have in the new building. Any questions that you might have? I'm sure you have some questions about the art and the uh, hiring of the art consultant. Welcome, Ella. How are you? Good. Line Council, we have any questions for Troy on this project? The design cult consultant just, just walked into the room. Well, I suppose maybe the most relevant question then you you are the art consultant on this project. Can you take us through your process of artist selection? Not yet, because we haven't even gotten that far. Okay. I just found out. Okay. So I like the direction you're heading with the building. We'll uh, have it back as you get more into the art elements or aesthetic. OK, elements with us. Well, in general, it's not exactly what we had vision from the very beginning. We had a lot of other type of materials, but I think uh, particularly with the metal skin, that was not something that we anticipated. But nowadays, with what the architects can do, it can make it look like it's uh, pretty fantastic. So yeah, we're pretty excited what the interior is going to look like as well. Um, we just wanted to get a vote of Confidence from the board. I think he's looking for a motion from us today. If he, if we're comfortable with the direction heading with the building, I'm assuming there was community engagement through all of this to figure out the the needs right from for the building. And we've been working on this for about two years, maybe even two and a half years. And a big part of what was the community engagement was really gauging what programs we're going to be doing. And so the design of the building is really designed around programs. So the gym, obviously, multi-purpose room in the kitchen were all things that were discussed in regards to programs and getting that feedback from the community what they wanted to see in this recreation center. Um, I'm going to quick throw a quick plug in there as well. That this is the first time we've been modifying or really actually addressing any of the recreation centers. And we have several other recreation centers that were built uh, the same time period of the late 50s, early 60s. 
And this is going to be a great opportunity or foundation for us to leap into doing modifications to the rest of the recreation centers. Uh, at least that's a goal and that's a vision. And um, so this is a great place to start. And we're learning a lot along the way, and this will have an impact on the future. I guess I have just one question. It looks great, by the way. Polycarbonate. I'll just make sure we do a research on that. Okay. About the building and how that all works. But I was really concerned about was uh, how does it fit within the rest of the, of the outer skin? And we did some research and making sure that it's not going to leak. Um, the other part of that we really kind of looked into was when we have actually panes of glass. A lot of the UV rays come in and discolor the, the gym floor and some of the other items in there. And our research kind of says that that's not going to happen here. So um, we kind of looked at it already, but if any suggestions of what are the things to uh, watch out for, let me know. Not specifically necessarily, I just want to make sure you have, that your team did a lot of research on it. Um, well, don't need to move a lot. And uh, I'm sure that this is a tried and true method, so I just want to bring it up. It's been used at a lot by the recreation centers. Um, the set of architects that they're working on, they actually use this in several other buildings that we looked at as well. So for the, for the record, as we were looking for a motion, Ella? That's what's saying. Amy from And then I'm looking for a motion. Funny, I'm looking at my two architects. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I, I was the last one. I'll make a motion. Put it. That was presented. That's what we want. What I want. Oh, a motion. Wanda, do we have a second? Second from Susan. Any discussion on the motion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes six zero. All right, next one on our agenda is the Commerce St. Francis from Kellogg Water. Bales. Bill. Uh, like Bill said, my name is Michael Bailey. I'm the project manager for Francis Systems with this project. Um, project team for this project, the Francis Systems is the uh, prime design consultant. Jeff Bess with LK Architecture is our landscape architect. And our art consultant is uh, Elizabeth Stevenson. Uh, Sean Mayus is, uh, is the project manager with the city, which uh, he's not able to be here this morning. Uh, Brief timeline before we get into the art on this project. It went to city council for approved the design concept in March of 2023. Uh, uh, as part of the, the that process, we issued a artist RFQ and RFP for our selection of our artist. Uh, those were selected in March of March 22nd of 2023. Um, selections was made up of a selection committee uh, from Trans System staff. Uh, Jeff Best was on that. City of Wichita staff, Sean, Jana, uh, Lindsay were on, also on that, as well as uh, Emily from downtown Wichita was on that as well. Our art consultant, uh, Elizabeth, uh, was not part of, did not play a role in the selection of the artist uh, due to you know her relationship with the artist in the in the area. So uh, the art uh, for bringing this today uh, for the first selection or recommendation of you know reviewing the art. Design concepts, so we can move on with final design, and the art budget on this project is four hundred thousand dollars. Currently, the schedule for the letting this is scheduled for a March twenty twenty four letting design, and the project is to be done in March of twenty twenty five before the NCAA tournament. Uh, so to keep mine real brief, so we can get into the art. As you can see in your packets, this is just kind of a brief overview of where the project is. Uh, these are the two roadways just south of Entrust Bank Arena, uh, Commerce and St. Francis. 
they extend from Waterman all the way down to Kellogg. Uh, Commerce is kind of a dead end street at the uh, under under Kellogg. The St. Francis uh, is a three street. Today they're both brick streets. As part of the process, uh, brick will be reclaimed. A concrete base will be put down. Existing bricks will be replaced on each of the roadways. As you, you'll see shortly, uh, amenities uh, working through Jeff Best and uh, Elizabeth, with our artist, will be sprinkled throughout each of the projects of uh, the entire length. These are just some quick overviews of um, concepts we've had up to this point. We're moving into our office check design uh, to submit to the city later this year. These are just kind of overviews of what the roadways will look like. There will be parallel, uh, you know, angled and perpendicular parking sprinkled throughout throughout the project. This is just kind of an overview map of, of proposed locations for the proposed art features that we have up to this point. And with this, I'll turn it over to our building Elizabeth Stevenson to walk through the concepts that artists have come up to this point. Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? I'm joining remotely, obviously, so that I'm still on. Yeah, we can hear you, Elizabeth. Awesome. OK. So uh, just to proceed this conversation, I just want to point out we are at the conceptual design phase for the artwork. So the pieces that you'll be seeing today are they've been worked through by the artists significantly, but there's a chance that during the design development phase, some of these designs will evolve slightly. So we will be coming back to the design council for final approval of the designs. So just something to keep in the back of your head. So yeah, as uh, Michael mentioned, we'll be sprinkling the work along Commerce and St. Francis streets. And you can see from this map, we've got a red dot where Eric Schmidt's work will be, a blue dot for Patrick Dugas, pink for John Harrison and Megan Miller, and green for Kent Williams. And I feel like most of you know all of these artists, but I'll just give you a quick run through. Eric Schmidt is a local sculptor, inventor. He uh, co-founder Fish House. He's working or has been for the last 20 years on sound and acoustic design or dynamics. And so the piece that he's proposing for this project is very much informed by his study. Patrick Dugas, local artist, painter, draftsman. Uh, he's shown in museums and galleries across the country. He has a studio here in Montreal. He's been working for a while uh, watching humans and reflecting upon their foibles. And so this is that will feed his work for this project, certainly. John Harrison and Megan Miller have teamed up. John is a multidisciplinary artist. He's working on sound currently. That seems to be his current area of interest, but he's done a ton of stuff. He's a musician, he's an educator. He invented a light box that you might have heard of many years ago. He's He's got his fingers in everything basically, but this is a sound project for him. And Megan is working with the sound in a way she is sort of rendering it tangible through her language of performance and sculpture and installation work. Ted Williams is well known to everyone. He's done a lot of large scale work around the city uh, based in Lawrence and Wichita. Uh, most recently he's had work, uh, he has work actually with Eric Schmidt at the baseball stadium, the piece that's at the Maple Street entry they did in collaboration with Steve Atwood and Kent recently did some work on the Harry Street Bridge too. So I guess we'll have to, we might need to refer back to this map, I guess, when we're talking about art locations. But again, these locations of not being carved in stone, this is sort of our first run through to try to sprinkle the work equally through both Commerce and St. Francis and give both streets uh, an aesthetic intervention, but perhaps concentrate a little more on Commerce because that Hopefully, once the art walks and once sort of the community gets up and running again, we'll we'll start to have some first or final Friday art crawls down there. So that's that would be the focus of those types of activities. All right, the next slide, I guess, Michael. So we'll start with Eric. As I noted uh, earlier, he will be he's he's been working with acoustics, and in this case, he will be exploring sort of the plasticity of concrete using a spheroid object that he is calling the cloud bench. 
And these benches are about 42 inches in diameter, 18 inches high. And they'll, there will be a light receptacle in a concave area underneath the bench that you can sort of see in the section on the top left corner. And that will give the benches the illusion of floating. And the benches themselves too, they've got small divots, as you can see from his rendering at the top right. And that's part of the, these aerodynamic surfaces that he's been he's been looking at. This is he's looked at spheres and he's put put these textures on cubes and larger scale like parts or shipping container objects. So this is sort of his his latest exploration of these textures. And you can go to the next slide where you can see the stainless steel mold that he'll be using to pour this concrete and give it a soft feeling with a very hard material. And the cloud bench uh, on the right there is, he's got that drawn in next to uh, Patrick's pieces. These benches will be, hopefully, I'd like, ideally, we've only got enough money to pay for nine, but I'd like to space them, you know, in throughout both streets so that they're used not only as a sculptural object, or they're not perceived just as sculpture, but they're actually used as a bench. So towards that end, we'll be putting them in gathering areas as uh, as we've drawn here, as we've rendered here on the right. So next slide, I think we're moving directly to Patrick's pieces now. You can see two of them on that slide. So Patrick's doing light boxes and he is exploring flies. And flies are interesting to Patrick because they are basically ubiquitous and they're one of the only organisms that have been around since the dinosaurs, basically every single human, every single sentient being, every single plant that's ever been alive on this planet has understood the presence of flies. And we all have uh, very strong feelings about flies. And as they are ubiquitous, they are a very uh, easy way to examine human behavior because we understand that a fly is unpleasant, but there is also something to be learned because flies act as waste cleaners and flies are harbingers of regeneration. And that's something that we're hoping will happen on Karma Street as well. So it's a particularly poignant image for this project, I think. So here are two examples of the light boxes in the series that Patrick is hoping to present them in. We can go on to the next. And th these again, these are placed only schematically at this point. We haven't identified the specific locations for them. However, we are looking at one at the end of the street. As you can see on the right, that would be a terminal view kind of piece that you'd be able to see from the top of the street. And that light box would be four feet by four feet. So you can see the relative scale on that wall. And his, uh, his concept is basically using flies as a way to, he's, he's a psychologist sort of consulting with flies. So each piece is titled and each fly is behaving in a in a very anthropomorphic manner. And these are a selection of the titles that he's identified for the flies that he'll be drawing for this project. So this is, you don't have to read them all, but if if you're curious, I can certainly send you all of the titles because they're they're rather amusing, many of them. Next slide, please. So John Harris and Megan Miller are doing a, a multidisciplinary interactive piece. And uh, you can you might have recalled from the slide that had the map on it that there were two clusters of their pieces, sort of one on Commerce, one on St. Francis that were sort of in visual distance of each other. But this is a sort of a an Easter egg type of project in that it, Megan's interest is in nature and the way nature and, and man-made objects interact. So they will be sourcing basically, hopefully from the city of Wichita, I think that would be poetry, but old, uh, unused, obsolete utility pieces, parking meters, and Megan will be molding using a malleable epoxy material, should be molding a natural, uh, natural sort of organic or inorganic features such as limestone or plant matter, or even unidentifiable sort of organic matter. And these, these nature is basically taking over these man-made objects. And within the objects, you can go on to the next slide, I think, Michael. So they will communicate wirelessly. And I understand that there will be, there's, there will be a lot of discussion about the tech 
And John Harrison, this is his metier, so I trust him implicitly. He has worked out the tech is going to be uh, low maintenance. It's all very like uh, marine grade speakers and speakers that are embedded actually in the objects themselves. So they, instead of having a diaphragm that vibrates, they actually vibrate the objects. So these are very low maintenance objects and technology. So the, the two objects will communicate and they'll be using sound as a way of interacting with the visitor. They'll be mixing sounds from a project that was started in, I believe, 2018 called Mac Music, which is a citywide sound collecting project. So they'll be mixing those sounds with sounds that they've that they're sourcing on site. They're recording and then playing back. And the two sculptures will they're visibly or visually in communication as well as orally in communication. So next slide. Uh, Kent Williams is partnering up with Steve Atwood on this piece to create uh, a very site specific tower at the at the top of Commerce Street, a, a gateway piece, as it were. And he's very inspired by the poles, the electrical poles that have really, you know, characterize the street from, I guess, the mid 1800s. Our building was built in 1872. So I presume the electrical poles have been around since at least then. There's a line of them that are basically aligned exactly if you're standing at the top of the street where Kent and Steve's sculpture will be. You can perceive his idea in context with all of the older poles that uh, we decided in the end, I'm, I'm glad now, we decided that we wouldn't run the electricity underground because it was too expensive and it would have blown the budget. So this is a really beautiful way of celebrating that historical element. So it's a three-legged uh, three electrical pole with those, like an insulator object. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the insulator objects, but they're rather small. These um, insulator objects will be blown up sort of probably four or five times their size and illuminated at night. Each one won't be self-illuminated, but the, the work itself will be illuminated. So you will hopefully also find reflection from the sunset and from the big LED screen that is currently at the arena that also pumps out a lot of light at night. So these the sculptures will be animated during the day and then at night with their their own self-illumination as well as uh, ambient light in the neighborhood. The next slide. Ah, we're done. Question time. All right. <clears throat> Any questions for Lord Elizabeth on the on the presenter? Question. The art that's on Can you speak up for us, Ella. The art, the art that's by Kent Williams, is it happening on all the poles down the street? No, it'll be no, it's just a large piece at the top of the street. Okay. Our question was about the the sound project with John Harrison and Megan Miller. Um, you were saying that it it's recording and playing back sound on site. Does that mean that if I'm walking down the street, I'm talking to my friend, it's going to record me and play play the sound back like it's spyware ish? That that wouldn't happen, right? Is they recording no, the sound? basically, yeah, they'll be mixing the sounds in with the map music sounds that are sourced from throughout the city. So it won't be a recognizable speech, but you would be able to you would probably understand that it is a human sound, a human created sound, but you wouldn't hear words and you would definitely not be able to identify the speaker or understand what they were saying. So when it when the when the device captures the sound on site, they're going to continuously be processing that sound and turning it into another thing or is that like yes. ongoing? It will be ongoing. It will be triggered by by sound and motion. When somebody walks by the piece, then uh, the sound the sound uh, element, I guess, will be triggered. Okay, I'd love to hear more about uh, some of the goals 
for the art elements in this project? Like, what, what were you envisioning this artwork to do in relation to the community and, and the, the arts district? Well, we're definitely looking towards the future in the art district. We've had uh, a good 30 years of basically growth and evolution and COVID sort of put a little bit of a, a point, a stopping point on that. And so I think the entire district is excited to see what the future holds. And I think we're all hoping that this, the money spent by the city, the money invested in our district will generate new interest and perhaps bring some development into the community, some further development and, and really help us evolve as a community within a community. So I think that the goal of the artwork, we don't necessarily have specific goals per piece, but we are hoping that this renewed interest and energy will, will spark something original and something unique. Would you speak more about how uh, you see this artwork uh, generating that interest from the community? Well, I think we've not yet had any public art on Commerce Street, and, and thus far the street has not really identified itself as such, as an art district, I mean. So I think we're hoping that with uh, sort of ob obvious public art, we do have some pieces right now. We have the, the horsetail sculptures, which I think have done a lot towards this end. But I think we're hoping that people will be able to walk down the street, even when the galleries are closed, even when there's nothing going on, and understand that this is an art district like you might find a similar type of area in other other cities of a similar size, just a small area where people are making and doing. And even if you aren't able to interact directly with the artist at the time that you're there, you're still aware that you're within a creative environment. <clears throat> Armando, are you asking what's the theme? No, no, not a theme, not a theme. Um, we're being asked for feedback, and my immediate reaction is I'm very underwhelmed um, by the art that is being proposed. Um, given that this is the sanctioned arts district in the city, and this is the, the investment that that district will get, for the foreseeable future, um, I guess I'm struggling to see with what is being presented, how this really celebrates the arts and the art community in the city. Um, I think Emily earlier did a great job and uh, she presented these um, uh, sort of benefits of public art, right? And, and um, there's some great goals, right, that she outlined, and I'm kind of those have been in my mind as looking through the presentation, and I'm falling short in seeing how this art um, will make this a destination for for visitors that are looking for art. I don't. Um, I'm struggling to see how it represents the art community. Certainly, how. It will bring that vision into the future of the art community in the city. Um, yeah, what happened? I mean, four hundred thousand dollars is not jump change. Jeff, chime in. I mean, part of the project is to been down there. It's hard to walk on commerce right now. I mean, everything's sure. uneven. Part of the project is you know, improving that walkability just for the business. But also, as you can see on the screen, there's a connection being made, or proposed connections, you know, between the two roadways for when there's an event at interest. Uh, in the middle of the two, the two brown pieces that cross the road, going to be brick walkable areas. So we're not only, you know, improving the walkable areas you know, along the buildings, but kind of making that connection between commerce. So, you know, it, I mean, there's obviously more parking on St. Francis, so people could park there and. When they have a you know first Friday or last Friday event, you know, they can easily get there more easier than they can today. Uh, then having the you know the art pieces sprinkled throughout, and, you know there's benches, 
the proceeding. Jeff will have you know node areas with trees uh, where these benches will be placed, and then some of the other art features throughout. So it's just making it much nicer to want people to want to go there. Um, so it's sure. and much easier to get there. Yeah, I mean, I understand, so. I understand that from like a redevelopment perspective, right? We need the the mm -hmm. roads and walkable sidewalks. All of that makes sense. Um, there is a tension though with the districts and the development that has been happening there in the last few years. There's uh, obviously more venues for weddings that are happening there. You have the interest arena. Um, and being an artist myself, I know that I've noticed a decline in the arts activity, right? Kind of feels more of a venue area than an art area nowadays. And that's a challenge, right? Looking into the future and see how um, this is a great opportunity with this investment to really bring this back into um, or becoming again the vibrant arts area and community. Right now, um, based on what you're presenting, uh, it looks like it's going to be a great cleaned up area for people who go to events like weddings or to the arena, right? I'm really missing that guttural, exciting art that is going to want to bring me there to look at the art, to look at this as an arts district. Right now, it feels like it's cleaned up for commerce. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying and, and trying to kind of formulate my thoughts a little bit. And, and I think I understand your point. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that any amount of public art will create a, an arts district or in and of itself. I think that's a, a bigger conversation, bigger process. Um, what I, I, I'm wondering about is public art being static versus changing over time. It's like with anything, a museum or anything else. You, you go once, you've seen it, you're probably not going to go again. Sure. But if you have changing things, uh, you're more apt to come back sure. to that place. Um, we did have a conversation early on about the light boxes, uh, Patrick's light boxes, and those potentially changing over time. Yeah. Kind of gallery pieces that over a certain period of time come back in with another installation into these these boxes um, down the road. Uh, that's the that's the only that's the changing piece, if you will, that we've had those conversations about. Yeah. So. That makes sense. Um, I immediately think about, to me, that brings a question of uh, a program, right? That's a programmatic piece that would not be a part of this budget, right? So that's a question about who, what, when, right? Yep. Um, so that tells me that it's likely to stay like that unless there's a, an effort to change the work in the future. Um, I mean, it's hard to ignore Right, that seventy-five percent of the artists, right, are connected to one space there, right. And if we're talking about the art community, then it feels like there's a lack of imagination about what the art community in Wichita looks like, right, when so many of the artists are connected to one specific institution there. Now they have been a big part of building the arts district, and that's important to to acknowledge, I think, right? And and there certainly should be the evolution of the arts district. Uh, but when um, those same artists are the, the vast majority of those being granted these these projects, then um, yeah, it just doesn't feel reflective of the art community or the arts district. I'll yeah. tell you, you, you know, it was an open solicitation. Um, I personally, <laughs> It's a little disappointed that there wasn't a better response from other artists. I don't know why that is. Um, they weren't hand selected or hand picked. So I, I don't know how to respond. And I think that's what we're trying to do in our subcommittee too, is, is trying to figure out ways of getting better engagement with public artists. Um, so we had to you know select with you know who submitted. Um, I don't feel 
at all bad about who we selected. I think they're all very qualified. Sure. Again, I would have liked to have had even more, but we didn't have that. Right. And again, it's not a question of um, qualification, right? But I just keep going back to this is the arts district. And this is the investment that it's going to get for the foreseeable future. Right? So it's it's an opportunity. Um, it feels like it's missed right now. So those are my thoughts and comments. Other questions, comments? I just, may I ask, may I ask Armando, I'm just curious, how would you propose? I mean, I understand and, and I agree we were we were all somewhat disappointed that only 27 artists even answered the call. And that was narrowed down further. And, and in the end, there were even five artists who declined to pursue the project. They were invited to continue and they declined and you were one of them. And I'm just curious how for future projects, because we're looking always to the future, how would you propose? And I understand this is a larger conversation, too, and a subcommittee has been formed. But this is as good a time as any, I guess, to sort of put that out in the public record. Like, how can we engage more artists? How can we get more people interested in actually pursuing the whole process and presenting legitimate proposals and being able to choose from, say, 20 wonderful ideas from a wide range of community members? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a I'm, big question. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure we can address. We're going to stay focused on the commerce street now and, and our critique of this project. We are trying to pull that apart in that committee, right? That is part of the purpose of that, because it's a big ball to. We're making progress. Pull apart. So one of my questions, Michael, was are you reusing the brick that's there or are you coming in with new brick? The brick in the roadway will be the existing brick. The brick on the sidewalks behind the parking on Commerce will be new brick. So yes, we are reusing the existing brick on both roadways. And it's all a red brick. Oh, I'm a little thrown are, by your color. Yeah, there's the colors aren't exactly right. Uh, I sorry, I didn't get the rendering quite perfect enough on right. the red. But I mean, it is. I'm just making sure <laughs> that we're not going to just can. No, tan bricks are no, it will tires. be the red brick yeah. out there. I apologize. Yeah. No, no, I'm good with that. If it's and if it's visual, I'm good with it. No, I'm sorry. And they're not interchangeable between the two streets because they're not the same brick, no, exactly yes. the same red color. So we've, we've been out there and looked at it quite a no bit. No brown brick. So. And I'm, I'm Elizabeth, I'm struggling as Armando is too. I think. All four of these art pieces are nice art pieces. I'm missing how they all tie together and how it represents the art district as a whole. Um, it's my struggle. The, the light thing Kent's done, I'm, I'm fine with the flies, more excited if that was changing over time. Um, benches are gonna look neat. I'm just I'm missing the whole, together well i think in this case i mean we're not really looking at least from my perspective i wasn't really looking for a theme specifically because you know the nature of an art district is a collection of artists who have either deliberately or sort of inadvertently gathered in the same place and they're all making their own stuff and they're all exploring different ideas and it's it's a real sort of think tank of creativity and i feel like a theme might have sort of corporatized it even more in a way. I, I really didn't want our artists to be working towards a larger goal in that way from an aesthetic or sort of theoretical perspective. I was more interested in just seeing what they're doing now and, you know, hoping that that will spark something in somebody who walks down the streets and, you know, looking towards further evolution. I think the more pieces, the better. It doesn't all have to be sort of city uh, city funded artwork. You know, the other challenge we had is all of the work had to be on city property, which is very limiting because all of the city property in our district is the street, basically, and small kind of sidewalk access by the buildings. So everything had to be something that was uh, very, that had a small footprint, 
and, you know, was was able to sort of interact with pedestrians, whereas I'm hoping that as the district finds renewed energy, various businesses might commission artwork to hang on their buildings. Like we've got a new business coming in at uh, five or 420 Commerce, I believe it is. And they're actually commissioning an awning and an art piece on the front of their building, like now, kind of as we speak. So I think what I'm hoping is that this is this will set a base, a baseline for sort of a, a creative endeavor, shall we say, and then hopefully property owners will jump on board and and bring in their own artists and basically pay for their own aesthetic intervention. But this is sort of all we could fit, like literally all we could fit on city property. Yes. Um, yeah, one little comment, then we're going to look for a motion. Okay. Um, so I guess in my mind, when I'm looking at this, I think about it in terms of a neighborhood and not the art district, because I think every neighborhood, the people in that neighborhood should have a voice in what art goes there. And that's what this looks like to me. It looks like the people, the artists that are in this this community here have shaped what the what this neighborhood will look like. You know, and everybody has the right to walk outside of their house and they see something that they like that reflects their values and all of that. So I don't know about the part of calling it this the art district, because it, 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 like you guys were saying, it doesn't reflect the diversity of artists in our city. Um, and, and then so then my next question would be the other neighbors in this in this area like the wedding venues and the dr wedding the dress the wedding dress shop and those types of people are they okay and do they approve of the artwork that's been designed as such or do have they have you talked to them do they have any opinions about what's being proposed we've had multiple stakeholder meetings the art has not been presented to them and i was discussing with city staff of typically it comes to design council first then to get and been presented to them yet yeah and yeah, then we'll come back again. Uh, but, you know, after this meeting, that's when we would present or send this out to the stakeholder group. We have a pretty vast stakeholder group on this, on this project. So stakeholders have not seen the art yet. They've seen the overall concept and we've worked through that for, as far as the roadway and the pedestrian way uh, on the project, but not they have not seen the, the art piece yet. I think that's a really key point. You know, like if I was getting married down there, do I want that? And do I want this artwork in the background? Because if it's becoming that, you know, and you're preparing for that future, then that those people need to be in the conversation, you know. Because that's how I'm looking at this. I I I know it's like four hundred thousand dollars. Gee, that's a lot. And I know it's been branded as the art district, but maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it's like this is a neighborhood, and these are the people who live and work there, and that's what shaped this. I think every neighborhood should have the opportunity, but this doesn't, to, to me, when I look at this, this is not the art district for the city of Wichita. It, it doesn't look like Wichita, you know? It, it just looks like the, the neighborhood, the people that are there. And I don't know when they say the art district, if it's, this is the intent, this is the city of Wichita. This is, this is an art district. There's a lot of artists that in, you know, long commerce, but it's not the city of Wichita's art district. No. We all know that the district has been in, transition. Wow. And I think that's a bigger conversation than just the public art. Yeah, I think that's what justified the amount, you know, because if you compare it to other communities, they don't get $400,000 to, you know, renovate their neighborhood. So that's what justified that large dollar amount, I assume, is that this was supposed to be the art district. All right, so we are looking for a, they're looking for a motion to approve the concept plans as presented. They would come back to us as they finalize all the plans and they, is it, so they, staff made a conscious decision to bring it to design council before they went back to the neighborhood to see what our input and thought was. So there will be more meetings, there will be DAB, there will be a neighborhood meeting. So that design council, do we have a motion?
do it. Cool. We abstain from that. I know. I know you're abstaining. I uh, I like the uh, like the canvas that's being created here. It's an objective thing. A subjective thing. Part of this, and I think this provides a an opportunity for a lot of art future. Uh, I've been down there. It's hard to get around. It's uneven. It's, it's a character, no doubt about it. I like it as it is. But I think having it uh, having it more acceptable, more open, probably more safe, is going to be a great thing. So I'll I'll approve this as it was presented for all. Motion to approve as presented. Second. We have a second from Matt. Matt and Matt. Matt and Matt show. Is there so a motion to approve? Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Was for approval for two. Jeff abstained. Right, next on our agenda today is the Proc Wetlands improvements. Um, Timothy. Timothy, hello. How are you? Doing well. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, Callum's. I play work in utilities uh, on the project uh, project. Um, we're very happy to present this in front of you today. Today we have uh, Carrie Tom from RDG and Connor and Snyder, our artist. Uh, RDG is also the art consultant for this project. Um, a little bit of background. So Proc Wetlands Park is uh, 91 acres. Uh, it's located near the intersection of West 29th Street and North Mays Road. You can see over here in the photos that um, there's a lot of different uh, things that can be used for this uh, site. A lot of people go out there and walk. Um, there's been some classes that have been taken over there to learn a little bit more about the wetlands. So uh, there's an educational component to this as well as just a regular recreational component for the, for the neighborhood and, and the general community. Um, there's a lot of neat things with this project and as we believe will continue to be a lot of uh, interesting and um, impactful places and elements that will um, kind of create a sense of place for this, uh, for this project that's unique uh, to the city. You can see there in the lower photograph there are some nighttime elements and interests. Um, so it's not just a daytime use. A little bit of background in early 2019 the initial uh, phases were completed in the, as you can see in the exhibit over there, um, the ones that are kind of in that shaded yellow are the completed phases. Uh, overall, this will be the intent for the master plans to be a loop connection. Uh, so this would be phase three, another, I guess, phase or section for this boardwalk. Um, there are a lot of viewing uh, wildlife viewing areas that you can have or these that are planned uh, throughout this project. You can see most of the site is actually planned to be uh, undisturbed, trying to keep that as natural as possible. There were uh, some trail around the perimeter that was put in with some um, mulch uh, to encourage the walking around the outside, but not really encouraging. Um, Movement throughout the uh, the heart of the, the park. So the current phase, phase three, will include the continuation of the steel boardwalk, duck blind, and uh, the corresponding art components to that. A little bit of background: RDT was the design firm uh, that did the master plan for it, and they also did the uh, phase one and phase two construction plans. And they're working on here for phase three. Um, the adopted 2023 uh, uh, CIP includes 1.5 million for this improvement uh, and 200,000 for art. And this has already been initiated uh, at the Design Council. There's also uh, this presentation has been updated a little bit since we went to um, the DAB 5 uh, last week. Um, so there are a couple of different pieces to this, a little bit more improved uh, renderings for it. 
uh, but we've already gone to DAB5. So again, just to give a, a general idea of what the site actually looks like um, uh, on an aerial, so you can see there that the boardwalk uh, um, over in this area is already completed. There's a wildlife viewing blind over here. There's also a trail which have recently had uh, trees planted along it, and we have a couple spaces for benches that we have that's outside of this project. Um, again, there's another part here that's already constructed going over the water. Uh, so ultimately, this will be a looped um, entire boardwalk, so you can kind of go all the way around. Again, this is just for um, the next component for that. The circular area here is where a historical uh, old duck blind was for the Proc family. They would go and hunt on the site, taking kind of this historical moment or, or space and trying to utilize that. That would be a great place for a node to have a, a wildlife viewing area and paying homage to the history of the of the site as well as the um, general slope of the site. You can see it, it is a little bit higher than the rest of the surrounding area. So again, this kind of creates a good viewing point. I thought this would be a great idea with all the history there that um, a wildlife viewing area would be perfect in this location. Going back slide here, you can see there's existing vegetation here already. Uh, so there we are providing a bit of a, a coverage already. Um, it is taking a look off I'm gonna bounce back a few slides here. You can see that this one is basically, as you can imagine it coming around, views coming out would be to a good open part of the site. You'd also be able to kind of look across and be able to make connections, visual connections on different pieces through this loop system with this viewing uh, blind over here. I'll turn it over to Carrie. Thanks, Tim. Uh, the image you see up here is uh, the linear blind that would be on the west uh, west side of the park, and that is extending the existing boardwalk, which is right at the end there. Um, that linear blind will be extended out as part of phase three, including more um, dichroic panels uh, with interpretation of uh, flora and fauna that can be found on. Wetlands Park. So again, our goal of interpreting uh, the nature of the park and the history uh, of the site will be continued as part of this uh, phase three. You can see in the distance the uh, wildlife wildlife blind in that area. Uh, we'll be using the same materials for the boardwalk as we did in phase one and phase two. Uh, as you approach the wildlife blind. Um, start to see some of um, our artist elements, uh, Conrad's elements. They'll talk about those here in a little bit. They lead up to the blind. Um, this view is an aerial view uh, looking west, so you can see the wildlife blind. Um, we're going to be using a corrugated metal uh, type structure, um, 410 or corrugated metal uh, structure to reflect the duck blind that was there before um, as part of the proc wetland family site, so using that same type of material to interpret the history of the site. Uh, we'll also be extending from the main boardwalk. Um, we'll have some composite um, wood decking as part of that to create a different material for the boardwalk, and that would also reflect what we did over the Lotus Park, so um, tying those materials together. And we also see, you know, we had the the full loop as part of the full master plan. We're wanting to create um, kind of different moments along the uh, full loop. So using a little bit different material at each of these moments, there'll be an observation tower as part of the next phase. So that'll probably have its own character and material as part of that too. And then we'll have some dissecting um, uh, boardwalks to create different views and that'll uh, continue with the bar grading that we use on the main boardwalk. We'll also have some bench areas uh, for sitting. We all have some cut metal panels on that wildlife blind structure. Again, uh, through design, we'll work through um, what that's going to be, whether it's going to be um, cut metal reflecting some of the plantings that are in the area or if it's 
some of the fauna or just more of an abstract design. That go further in design. But you can see here how this starts to create kind of some closed views and um, and starts to uh, help you interact more with the uh, wetland area. This view shows um, some of Conrad's elements incorporated um, into this into this area. This is just, uh, another view of that space. Uh, this is an area a uh, plan view. And so between the two different views, um, you'll see that uh, because of budget, we may have to um, only incorporate uh, a certain amount of the boardwalks, but we'll continue to investigate that further as we uh, continue design and um, look at budget. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Conrad. Very good. Well, thank everybody for their time. Looking at this, I've been excited about this project um, and being a part of it. I've been part of a couple of different uh, public projects in Wichita. And um, I'm a very hands on person and a tactile person. That's why I brought a few things for you to take a look at some of the ceramic um, glaze colors, potential colors, and some of the stainless steel and a couple of different treatments on that. Um, we looked at this project. I always like to try and look at what the area is, um, whether it's a community, urban, rural. Um, in this case, the wetlands are very important for bird migration. Um, so, you know, that that is the one one of the ideas that we uh, uh, try to bring in this phase of the project. Um, and the geometric elements in this uh, in this blind um, and then looking at the geometric shapes that are developed um, in bird migration. So the, the V shape of the uh, birds flying or the V shape of the um, uh, bird swimming through the water and the wake that's left and the overlapping wakes, um, sort of very beautiful things. Um, so bringing in something that's not, that's not uh, quite as organic, um, you know, in the geometric shapes, um, but bringing in an organic feel to it also. Um, so also the idea of macrocosm, microcosm, um, the birds stop there, um, rejuvenate themselves, they eat, they rest, um, they're hiding in the weeds and in the, in the clumps of grass uh, and wanting to kind of create some of that experience for the viewers. So as they come through, they can be in this microcosm and have these clumps of grass and kind of that experience of sort of the, the birds hiding in those clumps of grass. Uh, and and um, also the tactile interaction. Um, so you can see on the photograph there, that clay piece, um, these are styrofoam actually, <laughs> um, just to kind of represent what it is, but the clay piece has a much more organic feel. And then the textures of the grasses, um, vertical, grasses and the horizontal um, you know, ripples of water. Um, and then the way that stainless steel feels, the polished or the ground stainless steel. Um, and hopefully, hopefully also providing a visual, but a, also a tactile interaction experience. So maybe for somebody who's visually impaired either, and kind of experience, if these were close enough to the walkway, they could touch, touch these pieces and experience that horizontal vertical um, sort of visual elements of the environment. Um, we'd be hoping to do rather than one large piece, do a number of small pieces um, to again have that experience of being in the weeds, so to speak, um, these clumps of grasses. Um, again, working with budget on footings, um, we're still kind of working through that. What's what's possible, um, but maybe shooting for about 15 of these pieces somewhere in that range from six to nine feet tall uh and um the again the bottom would be clay and then the top would be this polished and ground um uh, stainless steel one inch that one inch round bar that's there with a slight slight curves to it so again it would make it a little bit more organic in the field 
Any questions? Questions for either Tim, Carrie, or Conrad. Um, this area does become submerged at times. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that that it does. Um, some parts. Uh, I think one thing to note also with sizes and everything too is that the boardwalk is elevated and it's uh, ADA. We make sure all the slopes of railings aren't needed or anything. One nice thing about this is that it depends on how close it is. There's a bit of a tactile element to it. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can engage with it, not just visually. Depends on how close it is. Um, I think one other, yeah, hopefully that answer. It'll be interesting to see how you can maybe integrate it in a way that you can touch it easily uh, without it, it, what that interaction is. It, it, you know, it's a little complicated. I'm sure you'll figure it out. For spring. And, and they were, if these bases are submerged in the water some of the time, it's not going to hurt the pieces. Um, actually, that's when I'd actually really like to see it is when it's submerged. Right, and and grass sitting in water grow up and obscure. I mean, because the grass out there can get three, three and a half feet tall, obscure parts of it, the lower part, and other seasons that are open. And also bringing in these colors, you know, the sunset, sunrise, the colors, colors of grass, different times of year. So that's, you know, trying to make it a little bit more colorful. Um, when generally we think of wetlands or grass areas as sort of our our hands as brown, <laughs> gold colors. Yeah, especially in the in the winter, it's a, it's a little beige. If I may, I'd like to plug a little bit. We we used the Rent Cafe and kind of explore kind of how we got to this point a little bit. Um, so RDG has an art studio as part of their team. They were um, hired as their art consultant. Then we used the Rent Cafe, which I think was absolutely very easy for us to go through. I think we had I think it was seven. Uh, artists submit. We shortlisted that down to three and then interviewed and then selected Conrad uh, from that. Um, so I thought it was very helpful and very easy to use that rent cafe and I think that we got some some unique submissions on that. So a little bit of history. It's a great solution. All right. Comments. So they're looking for approval of the 60% design concept today. Uh, can I make a comment? You may. Sorry if you threw your hand up. I got sun behind you. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, well, my first question was about the use of 410 steel. Uh, I don't know what you called it. The place where you view the birds. Is there a reason why that was selected instead of the treatment used before with the acrylic glass? I really thought that was beautiful. You know, with the... Yeah, we're we're actually adding more dichro glass to that linear blind. So that linear blind is a little bit different um, than this space, which is, will be the wildlife blind area. And again, we wanted to use that corrugated metal to reflect that wildlife duck blind that was there before with the proc wetland family. So okay. we are trying to tie that material um, again to help interpret the history of the site. Okay, so the reason why you specifically chose this metal is because you're trying to reflect something historical. Right. You want it to look aged in comparison right. to the, because I was like, ooh, that broad <laughs> glass and that shiny and it's responsive to the sky and the different color. And I was like, why you got Corten steel? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't know the history of the, this is a spot. Okay, because I was like, this looks like deer hunting a little bit. Yeah. So, But I hear what you're saying, duck blinds, got it. Okay, so then my other question was about these structures that are going, I feel a lot better now that you have this particular thing that has texture like the environment. Because when I saw this, I was like, oh no, it's man versus nature. Yeah, yeah. Steel and sharp things, right? And, but this, the way that you have integrated texture on the clay, that's cool and added color. The only part that feels some type of way about is the rod shooting up out of there. So I, I like that. I, I think the idea of bringing in more color using a natural material like clay, putting texture in it, that's beautiful and it's like in harmony. But the metal rods kind of like, it, be, it it's like going more towards distracting from the nature. Do you know what I'm saying? A little bit. That's why I'm getting thrown off by those rods. And referencing clumps of grass. I see. Yeah. And I guess going back a little bit, we do have some, you can kind of see over here and it's probably a good one, but 
all the of the boardwalk is this kind of metal on that kind of like gray color and mm -hmm. all these panels are also uh, that kind of gray kind of look. So I think some of the thought was that we have quite a bit of metal already out there. So tying the, um, the ceramic with the metal kind of merging them together to try to create this harmonious relationship and I don't have anything else. Yeah, it is a contrasting material. And and the other thing that, that that's going to do, call the, the polished versus the ground, and that's going to play with light a lot. Um, sunlight, daytime. Also, there will be this park, I think, closes at 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, throughout the season, there are a number of hours of the park. Um, but but light like this a little bit. Go back. Keep going. So the other thing I visualized, those are going to sit with a lot of landscaping around it growing up, native flowers, um, tall grasses, wetland material. But I mean, they're going to be sitting in this landscape, kind of popping, popping one, out, in my opinion. One of the things, uh, you know, uh, one large piece versus doing a number of large, or a number of small pieces, and I think that they live with the environment. That's what we're saying. You know, it's a very different material, uh, but that living with and having a bit of contrast, um, sort of a, a, a balance that we're trying to get with this. Stainless steel relates uh, to the walkway and the way the galvanized um, uh, grating on that, um, but also plays with the light and then the shape of it is sort of relating to the grasses. So yes, I understand. You know your your um, process on the contrast material. Um, we also don't want them to get lost in the environment, uh, uh, just to make more grass, but rather make some that interplay. Tries to bring the idea of migration, grass, the seasons, bring all that together. Are you thinking that at some point, because it's in the actual environment, that the ceramic would be completely obscured and you'd only see the metal rods? Well, it would be, it'll be close. I mean, because that grass does get pretty high. And I mean, that some of the ceramic mm -hmm. pieces would be between probably three and a half, six feet, and then the steel above that. So not all of them, because it'd be different sizes. But yeah, that that you know, I I always with my pieces, I I don't mind. In fact, I kind of like them sometimes very obscured, you know, by nature. Play is a great thing to live with. With me, also also to be a tactile thing. Just lasts. It's not going to get damaged by people interacting with it. The clay do okay freeze thaw. Yeah, if it sits like it fills up with snow or ice, and it... so the, so these will actually where the where the stainless steel is going to connect onto the piece. It'll actually shed water out of some of the water or something. So it's not going to collect water in there because yes, that could be potentially a problem. But um, this is cone tan; it's completely vitrified, so there's no like you all had flower pots that sit in the yard and kind of begin falling apart. But um, I worked for a, a company that made the clay sewer pipe. Um, and, and then vitrified clay sewer pipe. Uh, they did a hundred year written warranty. It had a thousand year life expectancy. And there's clay pipe that the Romans put in the ground 2000 years ago that's still being used and used every single day since. So yeah, definitely freeze thaw is an issue, but uh, get the water uh, collecting everywhere. Uh, and it holds up very well. And there, there are um, the Evergreen Park uh, Library. That's a couple Stella's and I think that's the pushing 20 years. And they've held up really well. You have maintenance or anything. Um, they are virtually maintenance free. So other questions? I have a question about those those rods. Um, with the finish, um, are you doing the brushed finish or is it gonna be the chrome? Um, it would be a combination of both. So some of the rods would be polished and others would be the, the ground. So, so then you have that it's a light material, but you've got different treatments and different responses to light. Okay. 
Yeah, and also, I mean, I don't know if you picked that up and felt it, but but it's you know that that polished surface is, is like sort of beautiful to touch and very different from other. I would actually move that we approve as submit. We have a motion to approve as presented. Do we have a second? Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous, seven zero. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the West Link Library. Martin Haney doing the presentation. And Chris. And Chris. Well, Jamie Hicks is in attendance to director of library. So what we're looking at is a significant addition to the library that's out there. It was designed kind of minimalist. It's a concrete. They used a in plan, 45 degrees in marketing. You don't mind, real quick, and I know exactly where this is. Would you, Claire, make sure everybody knows generally where that West Link Library is? Okay, it's uh, west side of Wichita. It's on Beckmeyer Street. Uh, just opposite Bishop Carroll is to the south, and then St. Francis of Assisi Church is to the east. Lutheran Church is to the west. Does that give you enough notes? Okay, on Tyler area. Central. Central. So what we've got is a strip of land. Um, it was designed using, like I say, different geometry, whether it was plan or elevation. So the uh, the plan used utilized 45 degree angles, and in the uh, it was designed to kind of emulate aspects of St. Francis Church. So one of the then uh, things that uh, was brought to our attention was the parking. That uh, it needed to greatly expand for the use of the library. This is the second most uh, utilized library in the system. Let me go to the next. So we had uh, the option of how to increase the, the parking, which this embraces. We also have uh, an automated system that's going to be added to this library to handle the large volume of books that uh, come and go to the library. And that's a drop off, it goes towards the northwest. One of the things that we were really challenged with was the turning radius coming off that and the tightness of the property. We also have a book drop that uh, comes from a truck that brings in the weight of materials. That's due west kind of in the heart of the existing building. We use yellow to kind of indicate what the existing library is and the blue is the addition. But what we've got in the front there by the, the drive is uh, currently a planter and an exterior stair it uh, goes to the basement. Both of those were nice elements of the original building, but they also presented problems to the library as it's evolved and it's been used. Both of them allowed water to get into the basement, so we were trying to find a solution that would be able to address the drive up window and also to eliminate water getting into the basement. So we've captured those spaces. Um, the original library is designed around the square, and at the center of the square is a skylight. Then there's a uh, a recess within the library that kind of celebrates that that light source that comes into the building. So other than that skylight, light is brought into the corner via the corners of the square. Otherwise, it's a solid mass on the other side. So this is just kind of a comparison of the existing library as it's currently laid out, and then blue for the expansions coming in. So one of the things we identified other than the planter I talked about is the triangle at the top was the entrance. It has um, two strong concrete walls that come in to, to become the entrance. And then there's a canopy that shoots up. Um, we love them. They call the, the pier at the front the nose. But, uh, it's always come across to me as kind of dark and forbidding, almost going into a cave. So we wanted to change that characteristic. So we brought the, uh, the glass and the vestibule out towards the front. We also eliminated the concrete pier that uh, the glass was sitting on, and we're changing the glass from tinted to clear again to to give a transparency to invite folks in. With this being the north, north exposure, we have a real good light quality in Bellish's library. 
So this is a plan of how we utilize the space. What we were looking at with the addition in the blue was again to, to celebrate the, the 45 degree angle. So there's a very strong um, line coming from the point where the planter comes down to the corner of which was the square of the library. That becomes the exterior wall of the children's area on our new addition. The transition between the existing concrete wall and our new wall is the window. So where it was at a 45 degree angle, we've rotated it out. It becomes the transition point between the changing materials. We've had quite a bit of uh, public input for this. We had uh, pretty much all age range uh, come out to the library and talk about what they like about the facility, what they'd like to see changed. Um, one of the, the points that uh, our partner, Margaret Sullivan group, was looking at was how to engage the teenagers. We really lose that age group as you go through the library. They have a lot of other interests when they're going through high school, learn to drive, that kind of thing. So we wanted to have something um, besides study and research to engage them. That became the circular element um, in the blue portion. We call that the team pod. So some of the other uh, activities that we tried to embellish with this plan, larger meeting rooms, uh, some study rooms, a uh, sensory area. We've expanded the children's uh, area. We have a maker space and then a uh, game area with the, the new addition. So this just kind of uh, is a simplistic uh, view of how we've broken down the spaces with the different colors, organizing the different meeting rooms, the administration, children's area, kind of like what I was talking about. But uh, the cohesive part is the stacks of the library that kind of embraces the center port and the port. So part of uh, not really identified as the art, but Margaret Sullivan's group has come up with a design for the flooring which uh, embraces both carpet and then the marmoleum. The marmoleum is towards the south. It is where we've got the maker space and it's going to be a little tougher on what would be carpet. The main part of the library is carpet and the demising point is kind of where the teen area is um, with the, the orange circle in the middle. The meeting rooms are a harder surface and we're picking up the acoustics with other materials in the room. The children's area is kind of a destination, so that the intensity of the circles increases as you go to that area. And then uh, like a next one. So then when we start putting the furniture in, it, it does diminish the, the intensity of the color and the pattern, but it also will still read through faces as you go through. And one of the things we wanted the ceiling to do was to reflect what was happening to the functions and the activities within the room. So you can see that the, where I've got labeled as living room, that's where the existing skylight is, which was the center point of the square of the main library. Um, it had that large area with, with the sloping ceiling. It transitions the skylight down to the lower ceiling. What we wanted to do was to take the, I guess the edge that goes around that and extend it into the main body of the library. We have a, a vertical pair of lines which raises that same element up but it lets the, the main sides of this, uh, what you call the scoop of the, the skylight, into the other area. The team pod becomes kind of its own element in that space. As you come into the children's area, kind of picking up on the idea of the circles on the floor, we've got these lily pads as far as suspended ceilings within that space. And it also transitions because the children's area is like three distinct areas. There's a presentation area, a stack area, and an activity area. So that becomes the transition. Over the worker space and the uh, play area, we're using suspended wood uh, louvers that come down as a sound trap. And it also gives the different characteristics it comes to the outside window. So our, our palette of materials are really based on the existing building. So they've got the 15 degree angles of the Rustication joints in the existing concrete walls. They're very specific about where the form ties were. That became part of the design element. So we're trying to embrace part of that. Over the existing uh, entrance, they had a bronze uh, colored uh, metal, which is actually copper pentated. And then typical to the original architect, there was, had to be a stone, which again reflects back to the material on St. Francis. So it's kind of a random veneer. So we are picking up on some of that. We've got the bronze finish. As we go around 
you'll see on the exterior, it changes or morphs from the old to the new. So we wanted to celebrate and maintain the part of the old, so the entrance is as it was. The side walls, both to the left and the east, are as they were. And then when the geometry changes, you go back to the south to the new addition, we're, we're bringing in some of the old and a little bit of the new materials, and we're using the geometry to screen different areas. So like this view is where the children's area looks out towards our east property line. That becomes a fenced area. It becomes an outdoor area for the children. We also bring the light in. One thing you kind of see is I've got some colored circles. We're trying to celebrate how the rainwater comes off the roof, and we have lily pads that are on steel columns, and it bounces the water down to a floor drain in the concrete. So that's not really part of our art, but it's kind of a celebration of how the building works. Uh, towards the front, I kind of talked about that we're bringing out the, uh, the best fuel to make it more welcoming, a little more light coming into the interior of the building. The way the original was designed is the west side was kind of screening element to the activities of the library, uh, the employee parking and the deliveries that come and go. That's going to be maintained. Um, the far west wall of our new addition is going to be the random stone pillar, what's used on both the church and the front of the building. To the, back, oh, uh, to the back, we've got a curtain wall that looks out to the children's area so that when the parents and the kids are out there, they can have this abundance of natural light. We've also used this rotated square as a, the ability to raise the volume within the library. So um, the original building is like a squished pyramid. So we only have like a nine foot ceiling that comes to the exterior wall. By injecting this, this rotated square on the front, we're able to get the ceiling up to 11 or 12 feet. So that additional volume again changes the character uh, of the interior space. As you go toward the very south, there's an existing concrete wall that demises uh, the developed space from the agricultural space. I think in the future that will become probably apartments or some other thing that's outside of our control. But we're celebrating that wall using the windows coming from the stack area, looking towards that wall, kind of bringing the outside in. So we kind of envision some landscape coming up on that wall to kind of soften the reflection that's coming off the concrete. We also have an overhang because that is to the south. So we're using landscape and, and the overhang as the shielding it off to the windows. But the front, again, to kind of change the character, but keeping the same, we're celebrating the rustication joints, these 15 degree angles. And we're inserting LED lights kind of in a random pattern within that. So the way I envisioned is we'll drill through the wall and just have the conduit come through the backside to feed the power. To but uh, in the evenings, Wintertime, I think that'll make a dramatic change to the front of the building. So, Chris, you might go through some of these and describe it. Yeah, some kind of, uh, again, different views of the outside. View of the approach to the facility, how we captured it on top of the planter. New drive through using the dark AC and metal. New build versus building on top of the old. On the low right hand that is taking you back around to the employee area. This is in the back outside and looking back. So playground area. But the mission is looking back in the corner. Um, the interior kind of see this is focused on the children's area, how we turn the corner. Kind of a procession is the way Margaret called the group identifies when you come from the main entrance back to the children's area. And when you get down to the people, that's a, kind of a celebration of what destination you arrive from. Do that. And you can see how it changes, the ceiling changes to the character and the function of the space inside. In the uh, main lobby, it's to me, the skylight, we're leaving it. As close to the ritual as we can. It's finished with a, a special uh, feeling tile that's no longer available, so the actual material will change. But to kind of uh, introduce the circles that are on the floor to the square that's in the ceiling, we're using the LED lights suspended within that space. So the team pod, uh, Steve Atwood was selected as our art consultant, and he's actually going to be design building this. Um, Steve couldn't be with us here today. 
But what uh, his concept was, was to use a custom steel that's in a tree form that's uh, coming from a radial point 15 degrees, again, kind of celebrating the French Renaissance. This would come out, and the idea is that we're trying to make a focal point within the library that could be designated for the teen area. Not necessarily that they're going to have loud music, but it's just a destination spot. Now, beyond the trees, what he was looking at was um, adding stainless steel icons as a uh, how would you describe it? as a evolution of our language. So he's going to look at how language has evolved from the very beginning through iconography, and he was using emojis as his example. So it's kind of uh, using that as a progression through language, and that seemed very appropriate to go through the library. What he was looking at was having these as laser cut, and it'd be something that'd be tactile that the kids could come in, they could get rubbings or etchings, they could have it to where you look for certain things. But uh, he was using that as the celebration of our life. Questions? I don't understand the last thing you said. The last thing you said about the rubbings and how those would be integrated into the design. So on the pod, that upper left view that we're showing us this kind of steel tree looking structure. Inside, Steve was proposing the kind of stainless steel tokens oh. that are similar to break their functions. Basically, we're going to come in touch me for the trick. They were on top of it. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. If you don't mind, I can I can read what you sent me for the, the meeting. He said um, language whether it's spoken or written has changed from our earliest forms of communication from cave walls to the library. It has been it is the intent of the artist to explore the history in visual symbols. He will be creating tangible tokens of our past and current language. These tokens will be engraved into stainless steel for the viewer to explore visually as well as tact tactfully. tactfully. Um, this section of the teen area in the library become an environment for learning, reading, discovery of images, and building on our complex lexicon of language. Well, he said it better than her. That was good. I have one more question. Um, when you were showing um, the elevations on the outside and how you're going to keep the existing, um, are, is, is this, you're going to keep the wall but remove everything behind it? Is that what's happening? What I'm to go plan. I, go I, I can understand the new walls, but I've gone to this library. I've taken my kids there. I'm really excited. This is yay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering. I, I know there's some old stone stuck in concrete kind of looking. So I'm just I'm I'm wondering, is that what's represented here that you're gonna basically take down the stuff behind the wall and just keep the wall freestanding? Is that what's happening? Kind of. Okay. Well, maybe. So all of the front, these concrete walls and the entrance will stay the same. I'm removing, you know, inside the entrance, I'm removing the glass and the little short wall. So then as you come around, like the parking lot for St. Francis is over here, um, this wall to that point will remain the same. That's the concrete with the V's that come down and has the very signature scupper that comes off and the berm remains. Um, so then when we come to this window point here, which is that 45, we're going to transition the glass back into this plane and use that as a transition. So then everything from that point becomes similar but different as it relates to the function inside. Same okay. goes for the north or the west side. All of that exterior stays the same. And when we come to the blue point, we lose the window at that point, and then the wall extends out in the same plane, but we're going to finish both the little section of concrete and our new construction with the stone. So that will kind of tie back to um, right now, there's a little bit of stone on this face, and then back at the employee entrance, and then the, the pilasters are piers at the corner and at the front. So we're trying to tie that in. Uh, to the west, we will have some punched windows through the stone. So that's bringing light in that we didn't have before. Um, so the main thing is this west wall, which is identical to this one, I am taking down. Uh, the structure comes down to only nine feet. And if I take that out and peel the joist back to this um, center core, basically to here, then I can run the structure all the way out and it gives me a taller volume once I get past the sky. So I lose the west wall, but nobody's ever seen it really. Um, but you still <laughs> have that expression uh, to the west of the parking at St. Francis. Okay, 
I just was trying to see if it was reading like like wings, almost like you have walls, but you're you're removing what's behind it. Because that's kind of how it looks on your and I just wanted to clarify if that's what's happening. Or are you saying you're you're it's not wings out, you're attacking something. Back on the existing south wall. Yes. Basically blow that wall out for the condition that was there. We're staying the same. Okay. So the wing walls, the arms of the building. The vehicles come up. The Those are that comes down and that wall that comes down, which are the signature at the front entrance, the kind of the bracing arms. Those stay the same. Okay. So then we are putting the, the bronze metal kind of similar to this on top of that wall. And then it turns the corner and becomes, takes over the planter uh, to get the water out. And then it becomes the, the drive up window. Okay. We're using the color to kind of play it down a little bit. And it kind of will, at least in my mind, it'll celebrate more of the concrete by being this starker background. That's going to be interesting. Other questions for so, uh, Martin or Chris? Architecturally, I love it. Um, on the um, emojis, or what we're talking about, the iconography, is that going to be, is the intent for that to be randomized, totally random, or is he actually going to try, and I don't speak in emoji, so I'm going I'm to just ask this question. Is there a way, or is this intent to convey a message or messages through just the use of a series of emojis. That's something that seems developing now with how it's going to be presented and which emojis may or may not occur. And we don't speak emoji either, but I understand there's some that may be inappropriate for a lot of it. <laughs> but I, Anna, did you have his presentation as part of this or was it just a my go through? Um, and I'm going to jump in real quick and, and point out looking for two things today. An approval of the building concept and where they sit today at 80% to the concept for the art being the 30%. And if they fine tune the art, that will come back to us at least one more time. I just want to clarify where the art is. We're looking at the treatment on the floor and the treatment on the uh, team plot itself, the, the, team, right. the whole structure. Okay. okay. I think in addition, throughout this space, there are going to be visual elements, of natural wildlife of Kansas. Um, kids are going to be able to measure themselves against a bison, for example. Um, I think there's a lot of window and additional um, wall treatments that will be throughout to kind of surprise and like what the youth space is going to be. It's a, will be a projection screen in the children's room where we'll be able to do use of nature or with graphs or um, a lot of technology will come out to give us um, flexibility for how the images into it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I noticed some of the illustrations here in the slide. And that's what Steve was trying to pick up with the some of the panels on the back of his was. Uh, the waves he attributed that to the hills in Kansas. And I think the Margaret Salt Company is looking at more of the wind, how it changes. That was what same is referring to. Uh, the color palette too has been from um, wild flowers native to Kansas that have been photographs taken by local photographers and people who care about plants. So it's all like trying to bring nature and the end find it this really concrete stone. Have a good, good vibe. Questions? Motion. Motion. Motion to approve the the concepts presented. Second. Including the building number to add in the concepts is your second. Mondo, second by Susan. Did for the record, Pam, uh, any. So, discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 
Those opposed? Passes unanimously 6 0. Martin, thank you. Thank you. Good job. In before dude. Almost. We're all, we might make it, we might not. So, we've got one more item. Oh, last God. item on the agenda today is uh, approval of the DEI presentation. <laughs> it's going to be the last two pages of your packet. As a real quick summary, our ordinance allows us to use up to 10% of the funding for um, aesthetic improvements for main purposes. This year, since we are presently, and you correct me if I'm wrong on these numbers, Lindsay, we presently have $50,000 a year that is available that we use for maintenance. 25, I'm trying to well, get to it. 75, but that includes 50,000 for the conservator. Yeah. There's where I'm getting my 50 number. So they use about $25,000 a year for maintenance, and then they beg, try to get other stuff fixed. Our subcommittee made the decision that since our ordinance allows us to use some of that funding for maintenance, that we're starting that program in 2020 EIP, or putting in the maximum amount that we can up to the 10% for maintenance of the art. So that means when we do that, um, 2024, $160,000 projects by $160,000, but we're at least going to be able to maintain and take care of things that we have. Um, so the summary there for you, and really the one you want to look at is 24. You can look at 25, 26, pass that at the problem. We, we try to fund out and start. Um, and again, next year when we do this, we'll relook at 25 and we can take projects up or down, but those are the projects that we're allo allocating to for 2024. What we're looking for today is a design council for us to move that forward with the finance department. The recommendation ultimately city council can accept or edit as they see fit. Is this a time to make changes? Say that again. Is this a time to make changes? Time for you to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only one that really pops to mind. Well, there's two. There's a police patrol station, and then there's the libraries, Alford, Angelo, and Rockwell. Um, it feels ludicrous to give three libraries $90,000 and to give a single police patrol station $325,000. I can't quite make sense of that in my head on that one. Yeah. Especially after looking at the impact the Evergreen Library has had since it's been renovated, looking at this proposal with this library, it looks great. I just can't in good conscience justify $325,000 for a police patrol station and the $90,000 divided among three libraries. I don't know how everyone else feels about it, but it we've had a lot of conversations. If it helps you, we've had a lot of conversations about the police patrol stations and how much do we fund those? We're trying to create interior and exterior spaces for people at those patrol stations also. Um, you think nobody's really, the public's not there. Well, the public is at the police station. In a car accident where they like come down, file a report. Sure. Somebody calls and they say, come by, swing by, fill out a report, we'll take care of it. So the public's in and out of the police station quite a bit. Only when you're going there, it's not a great day. <laughs> you're not going there for a good reason, visiting the police station. 
Um, but how do we do you have any number? fair conversation and one we've had for the last two or three years? Conversation specific to the libraries. Um, three libraries listed here are much smaller in scale and enhancements than we see today in West, West Link. Um, so the amount of money that could be applied is actually quite a bit less as well. So the Alford uh, Library Enhancement Project is about $600,000 in total. Uh, Angela Library is 120-ish. Um, Rockwell is about 370,000. So the amount we could even apply is quite a bit smaller. So they're not massive renovation projects. They're listed in this case as enhancement projects. So that's helpful to kind of think that's about the scale of the work. Phil, is the police substation listed here in 2024, the East, plus, the East substation? One of them is already funded. The East one is already in a CIP, even though it's fallen behind. It was previously funded, and I was think this one's the West one, isn't it? Oh, good call. Yeah, East. Yeah, on the side, that's correct. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And for my my two cents worth, I do agree with the sentiment that the library should get a little bit more versus the East station. To be honest with you, work on WPD East. It was more of a challenge to figure out exactly what to spend the art money on at a police station, given that it's not really a cultural type of facility. Um, if it were me, I would agree. Drop the WPD West art a little bit, add more to the libraries. Lindsay, just so you're aware on Rockwell, Rockwell did get bumped up quite a bit as far as the project goes. More ARPA funds were added to that project, so it's going to be a more substantial renovation than this plan. So Rockwell will be a bigger project, and I agree there's more our opportunity libraries in there. But yes, the money we're looking at now is for it. Which construction will start next year? Rockwell will, for that, yeah, for that Rockwell will start next year. The PD West will start next year. Rockwell, hopefully, yes, will be as well. Yeah. What's happening with the uh, Finley Ross Park? That's the one by Century 2, right? So that actually is $150,000 in this year, 2023's budget. And okay. 1000 limit for next year. 100,000. I would like to speak. I, well, I can. <laughs> so we have hired GLMV to do a concept study on that or concept plan right now. Um, and part of that will be um, we have just met with some stakeholders. Um, First and foremost, um, the uh, lunch counter that was at Chester I. Lewis, that, is, that park has been targeted to put that there. Um, we have worked with GLMB um, first and foremost to uh, you know, part of that's going to be ADA accessible down to that park. So um, currently we have um, them, uh, GLMB, they will be completing the concept uh, drawings at the end of this month. And we'll see where it goes from there, but there's a million dollars in the CIP uh, program now. We know that it will take more funding to do, you know, what probably the concept is, but more to come. That would be another opportunity, just like from doing this Chester Lewis Park project. It takes a lot of money to, to do something meaningful and significant on Douglas. So that's another spot where. Yeah. If if funds are going to be shifted away from the police station, that would be another possibility. Um, do we know if any of the money allocated for art right now is going to be used for the relocation of the sculptures, or is that a separate pot of money? Could you repeat that? Online? Do we know if the money currently allocated for that park, if any of that money is going to be used for the relocation of the bronze sculptures? Is, is it going to come out of that or the cost to relocate them? Plus, or is that going to be like a. We know that, that discussion hasn't been had. Okay. okay. I don't know. I, I will say if it has, we have a million dollars total attached to the project CAP. Is that correct? Yes. Plus the additional. 200,000. Yes. So we're getting yes. to the max of what we can, can apply for. I do know Troy is. Not in the room, uh, but there's a significant amount of private dollars that are still being. So that 10% really is a little 
it's not just guidance. It's like a rule. For the maintenance portion of it, I think that's. I mean, it's temporary. No, it's it's a job. Right oh. for art funds. Right. We've gone back and forth about this. Is it really a rule, or is it guidance? What is it? So two percent of the total CIP is allocated to art funding. Yes. In that annual amount of art funding, um, design council. Council can allocate those funds as they see fit per project. That this is the, the discussion is whether the project each project has a maximum based upon the construction cost, the total construction cost of the project. This is what we've gone around and around about about whether that's a recommendation or whether it's a rule. Um, I can double check the the art ordinance again. Um, Design Council does have the ability to label a project an icon project, and then additional funds can be allocated to um, that specific project <coughs> or art. Um, let's see. I think the 10% is, is written there, but we can ask Council, we can try to work around that at times. I think it's written in there and we've been back and forth on that. Yes. Is so if there's a cap right on a 10%, then we are limited on adding funds to some of these projects. Yes. So it's just a matter of looking at the art ordinance real quick. So this isn't, I'm not. Trying to defend this, I'm trying to explain how we've done this over the years. And that lease stations and fire stations, libraries for that matter, these are remodels. Understand the three that are on there. Really want it to look at not using the cookie cutter, every police station looks the same, but you get a chance to do a little character to the outside of it that fits the neighborhood. Or if you felt like a courtyard was appropriate or an entry feature was appropriate with it, it's not part of the budget for that police station. So we intentionally ran these up a little bit to make sure that we could create something meaningful and not swap something in it or on it. My best example is the fire station on 21st, East 21st Street, where we're trying to build stuff that asks it's the character the neighborhood not just everyone yeah. looks the same but anyway you're making a valid point i'm not arguing I'm yeah. and i'm not against about, about having any art in them you know i mean going back to commerce commerce gets four hundred thousand, and then the police station gets almost the same amount right yeah. there was a point in time where commerce was a million it got pulled back to four hundred thousand. That's when uh, at one point in time it was at our district. This feels inflated. I mean, I'm not opposed to them getting money, but it seems like a lot. I wouldn't disagree. So, I don't know how we move forward. That's just my thoughts on it. So where are we sitting time wise, ladies? I'm sorry, you're in the middle of reading. I was. I, Started speaking before I looked. A brief cursory review. Um, there is no percentage requirement, but there are suggestions. But I will. I will look at it. Look at it. Oh, where are we at time wise? For the CIP approval. Yeah, for us to. It in queued in with finance department. I believe the first reading of this budget is going to city council Tuesday, if I recall correctly. And then, yes, tomorrow. And then final approval August, I believe. All right. I don't have that date, but the draft was. Printed and submitted to City Council just Friday. So this draft is on. It's still available. 
you suggest? Your chance. 200,000. How about that? How does that sound? The libraries. Um, oh, wait. You're saying make the police stations 200,000? Yeah. Two. Yeah. What, what specifically? Police one. Five. Um, Rockwell, is that the one that is getting the more substantial renovation? That is what I understood from the yeah, years. We just walked out. Yeah, and that was how much that they're getting right now? 60,000? It's 90,000. You know how much each one? I've broken out. Okay. Yeah, well, we can adjust that. We yeah. see that based on it. Each one. Uh, this is just me putting numbers out there. Um, police station, 200K, libraries, add another 50K. Balance. Um, over. Uh, well, if you take uh, PlayStation down to two, you have 125. Does the money roll over? Or are you just banking it? No. Okay. You don't use it. I use it. All right. You, you, you want, you do not have to. You want to use it. You don't want to go to council not using all the money available. I think some more should go on Finley Ross Park. I mean, I know it's a small park. It's just, I, I, and I don't, I don't know what it's the concept you were talking about. I don't know what that. We lost fifty thousand. We slid it back in. Somehow, that's why there's because Finley Ross was funded in the twenty three CIP, and you got shorted. Yeah, Finley Ross totals two hundred. Slid it back. Okay, that's one hundred fifty thousand in twenty twenty three, and then fifty thousand in twenty twenty four. The Douglas Seneca of Meridian is another big project. Oh. The RFQ for Douglas Seneca of Meridian has been issued okay. for artists with those art budgets in the RFQ. Okay. okay. Oh. Oops. Come on. Oops. Uh, well, can we move 50K to the libraries from the 325? You get 275? Yeah. What you're saying? Uh, yes. That's still a pretty good chunk. The, when we, there was another document we were going back and forth between, even for this canal crossing, like one said 250 and one said 200. You know why that was? Documents are you referring to? It was what it looks just like this, but one maybe was like the proposed, and what was the final approved? Do you know what I'm talking about? In what context? It Did was it was like the 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 documents that go on the city council subcommittee man. No, it's the documents that go in front of city council. On one document it says two fifty, on another one it says two hundred. Do you know why the 50,000 was taken out? On immediate thought, it was the 50,000 for Finley Ross. That yeah, was it. So that's, that's where this particular project from 15th Street Bridge. Do you know why there's two different numbers? I think it was an error in the finding. Okay. Yeah. That's what the Design Council approved last year versus what got published. It got published for final. Okay. That way, when we were reviewing this here, the fifty thousand for Finley wasn't there. It is now. My immediate thought about. So my biggest comment, my biggest issue is 
We had a subcommittee sit down and, oh, you're on it. I'm on it. We hashed through this thing and we've got six hours in putting this recommendation together. Could sit down in 10 minutes and plug the number, move the numbers around, which if we're wrong, we need to be asked about. But this wasn't a one hour project where we threw some numbers out and went, yep, that's what we're going to run with. So we had some pretty thorough conversations, Armando, when yeah. we did this. My comment when we did have our subcommittees was that the libraries needed more money because. You know, you know, like I was saying, like you don't want to make the police station a place where kids want to go. Like it's so beautiful. <laughs> you want them to go to the library, to the park, you know? So, and then we talked about how people go there and they're in the worst situation, you know, and, it, and even for the people who work at the station, it needs to be in a certain type of environment. But yeah, I mean that it's 200,000 is comparable to what the fire stations would each receive. It's just, what projects are left that funds can actually go into these not done? It would be, you know. Yeah, so I don't want to undo all of the work and time I've put in it, uh, but I do feel strongly about adding at least some money to the libraries. I think you should add some to Finley Ross Park. I, think, I don't know what it looks like. I haven't seen anything, but maybe y'all have seen it and you don't think it needs it. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. I just know it's expensive to do stuff down there. Well, it's expensive for every project. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's Finley Ross or it's something else. I, I do feel like we have to, somewhere along the way, have an idea of a cap. Yeah. And I'm perfectly comfortable with a cap at 10% unless someone brings me a really good reason to go over it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying those reasons don't exist, but I don't know if Finley Ross is to present. I, I don't, I don't know what it is either. Yeah. So I don't, I haven't, I have no reason to believe it needs. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am comfortable moving money over to the library. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the projects offhand to sit here and decide how much. I don't it's 50 or 75 is the number I'm playing with, but I don't remember. And I know we got into what are they doing? Um, but as we sit here today, I don't. Yeah. I would suggest if you want to move some, you either take 50,000 or you take $75,000 out of station slide it down to the library. I'm okay with that. Number you want? Uh, I was going to, I was just playing the ground numbers 150 into the library all in, so it's 960. I would just run it to one, run it up to around 150, and gotcha. then that leaves you 265 on the police station. Oh, that's in between. Yeah, again. 265 on the police station, 150 for the libraries. A motion. Yeah, is I move. Yes. Two. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you entertaining me. You should have made. True. Be Agenda, so I'm going to bring it up to through, but I got four twos, and that's Would you post any? We're supposed to adjourn. We adjourn. We officially adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Matt.